So this was just the normal distribution. So in general, if mu is a target distribution, we find a suitable operator A and the large class of functions F of A, such that X has distribution mu, if and only if for all F in this class of functions capital F, the expectation of A f of X is equal to zero. So in the normal, this was expectation of prime of X minus X F of X, this operator A of X, but we could think of other operators. And then we have a class of test function H, um, which uh, are defined on the support of the target distribution. And we want them to be measure determining. And let's say excess distribution mu. And then we find a solution of this Stein equation, H of X minus expectation H of X is A F of X. So the solution is F, which will depend on H. And then again, we can replace X by any random element W on both sides of the equation and get expectation H of W minus expectation H of X is the expectation of AF of W. So we can compare the distributions of W and X through the operator A. So to make this a little bit more explicit, if we've got um, two distributions, mu X and mu Y, with Stein operators AX and AY, and X has distribution mu X, Y has distribution uh, Y, and there, um, there are functions on which both, for which both of these operators are defined. Then for Stein operator, we have expectation H of F of X is zero. So the expectation H of X minus expectation H of Y is the expectation A Y F of X, which we just said, but now we can also subtract the expectation of A X F of X uh, without any harm. And so the supremum over all H in our class of test functions of the difference expectation H of X minus expectation H of Y is less than equal to the supremum over all F in the uh, support of these operators, expectation A X F of X minus expectation A Y F of X. So in principle, you could say, okay, that's done. So this is how we can um, assess the distance between distributions. But this talk is actually culminating in looking at goodness of fit. So when you try to assess goodness of fit, um, it's very difficult to assess these supremums. So there's a, a whole technology which we will look at. And also we, are, um, we want to look at um, specific distributions for goodness of fit. So Stein's method has been extended to many other distributions. So Poisson distribution, Lewis Chen, multivariate normal um, by Barber and others, compound Poisson, um, Barber, Chen and Lu, binomial, gamma, beta, variance gamma, Laplace. And we also have a general framework, which uh, actually goes back to Stein, but uh, also worked on with uh, Evix Swan and Christophe Ley and Guillaume Mijoux. It's been applied in a, in a large number of areas. So sequence comparison, um, random, random simplicial complexes in topological data analysis, iterates of expanding maps, so dynamical systems, uh, Bayesian analysis, effect of prior and posterior, um, uh, statistical tests, chi-square tests, um, and also high dimensional data analysis, or what pe some people call machine learning. And the last, uh, application. So the last part of this talk will be in this um, region of high dimensional data analysis. So first, how do we find the Stein equation? So there are different ways. And one way of doing it is the what's called the generator approach. It uh, was pioneered by Andrew Barber and um, Friedrich Götze came up with it at about the same time. It just took longer to have this paper published. And the idea is to choose as a Stein operator, the generator of a homogeneous Markov process with the stations, the distribution mu and transition semigroup TT. So, so the generator of Markov process, if you don't know what it is, it just describes the infinitesimal development of the process in a small time interval. And if the process is mu stationary distribution, then this infinitesimal uh, 
shift uh, time, time interval, um, after that, the process will still be in the stationary distribution. So the expectation of this generator will be zero for all functions f for which it's defined. And formally, um, we can solve the Stein equation using the transition semigroup of the generator, if it exists so through, through an integral. Um, so, so it's a very nice framework we can, because we can, uh, so we have a generator and we have in principle an idea of how to solve the Stein equation. So this has been uh, applied for multivariate distributions. So multivariate normal distributions and diffusions uh, and the Barber um, looked at that multivariate elliptical. Uh, it's a paper by Lanzmann, Van Duffel and Yao who did it without realizing. Uh, strictly log concave densities, we will come to that a little bit later. A DOK distribution, exponential random graph models, we will also come to that a little bit later. And there's also a series of, of papers about general discrete multivariate approximations by Andrew Barber, Mavima Luchak, and Agak Shah. And there's the paper by Young, Young et al, um, which looks at discrete multivariate also for um, goodness of it. So how does it look like for the multivariate normal? So for the multivariate normal, the Stein characterization, well, there are different ways of characterizing the Stein equation, but, but the standard Stein characterization is that y is multivariate normal with um, mean zero and covariance matrix sigma, if and only if the expectation of y transpose, uh, the gradient f of y is the expectation of gradient transpose sigma gradient f of y for all smooth functions f, which go from rd to r. And then we can set, set up a Stein equation, gradient sigma gradient f of w minus w transpose gradient f of w h of w, minus expectation h of sigma half z. So this sigma half z is just to scale to normal um, uh, with covariance matrix sigma squared. And you see this uh, um, um, gradient transpose sigma gradient f of w, this is like the second derivative, so f double prime of w times sigma squared. And this is uh, like w f prime of w in a univariate case. So this is just like the normal sign equation only with one higher derivative. And we can write down the solution explicitly um, using a, what's called the Miller formula. So ZW2 is an interpolation process. We take sigma half Z multiplied by the squared of one minus T and we add squared of T times W. So we have an explicit form for the solution of the Stein equation and we can bound it. And this has been extended by Mackey and Gorham to strongly log concave densities. So I've just written down again what we mean by log concave. So log concave just means that for all x and v, um, this quadratic expression v transposed um, gradient squared f of x v can be bounded by minus k times the uh, L, a2 norm squared of v. So for example, the Gaussian is uh, strongly log concave. And uh, for a, a strongly log concave distribution, we can write down a, a generator AF of x is um, a half the scalar product of gradient f of x, gradient log p of, um, uh, p of well, w, so gradient f of w, uh, gradient log p of w, plus a half uh, the Laplace operator of f of w. And this is the generator of a Markov process uh, that WT, which is um, an overdumped Langevin diffusion. And we can write down the Stein equation, A of, of W, so H of W minus expectation H under the distribution P. And this, the solution is again of this form of, of a Miller formula. So this is uh, the picture for um, multivariate continuous distributions. Um, I'm very interested in the analysis of networks and network distributions are multivariate, um, but not continuous. It's, it's clearly discrete. And the family um, that I've been looking at with, with Nathan are exponential random graphs. Exponential random graph models are used to model social networks. One example is the uh, Florentine marriage network. 
that you see here. So this was um, a network compiled by Paget based on tax records in Florence in the 1400s. And here, two families were connected by an edge if there was at least one marriage between these families. The families chosen here in the plot are the, um, the 16 families in Florence which paid the highest amount of tax in that period. So, so you see here, let's say the, um, the Medici family has marriage links with Barbadori, Sal Salviati, and, and so on. But you see, they don't have a link with the uh, Strozzi family. So the Strozzi family is here. It's also got many links, but not with the Medici. These two families were actually um, arch enemies at the time. So you can sort of see that in the marriage network. So this, this kind of network was then contrasted with business relations to find out whether business relations and wealth and marriage could be related. Um, so there's, it's a standard data set in, in a social, net, uh, social network analysis and uh, goes back to papers uh, by Holland Leinhardt and Franken Strauss, Wasserman and Faust, who then um, introduced exponential random graph models. So what is an exponential random graph model? So we, we look at a, a graph which, are, um, which is simple, so no uh, self loops, no multiple edges, undirected, we have got a finite number n of vertices and the vertices are labeled, for example, by the family name. Each graph is described by a vector, uh, a zero one vector um, uh, of length n choose two, where we have an indicator for each potential edge, whether it's present or not. So xij is one means that there's an edge between vertices i and j. So the exponential random graph model um, works as follows. So we have um, t1 up to tk, which are real valued functions on this network, and beta is a k vector of parameters. Then the exponential random graph model says the uh, um, the, this vector x of edge indicators is, has, is equal to little x with probability um, proportional to e to the power sum l equal 1 up to k beta l t l of x and proportional meaning that we have a normalizing constant. So the, the form is uh, so of this exponential family type form it's uh, or um, physicists would look at this expression as uh, Hamiltonian. So it's a, it's a natural way of describing a probability model, which actually has a, a probability not zero for all of these uh, networks. The problem is that the kappa n of beta, the normalizing constant is usually intractable. So you could calculate it by summing over all possible networks x, but if you've got n vertices, and you've got two to the n choose two possible networks on it of our type. So that's very quickly becomes unwieldy. You can't calculate it anymore. So um, to, to introduce the result, uh, which Nathan and I derived, we fixed um, a, a special kind of functions t, but which are graph counts. So we fixed uh, small connected graphs h1 up to hk and say vl is the size of the is of the vertex set of hl and t of x is the number of edge preservance in x preserving injections from v of h to v of um, the vertex set of the graph x so this edge preserving injection this, this is the way of counting subgraphs so you, you inject the subgraph into uh, the, the graph x would be observed. And then we scale this in, by dividing by n times n minus one up to n minus vl plus three. So this is if um, vl is at least three, so we don't divide by zero. h1 is always taken to be a single edge and t1 of h1 of x is twice the number of edges of x. So, so this is how the scaling works. So this is a, a slightly uh, a, a scaling which might look slightly unusual 
first time, but it's it is what is used um, in related work for deriving approximations. In particular, so if k is equal to one, if we only have uh, edges as um, as counts, then this model has the same distribution as a Bernoulli random graph. But, and the edge we can express the edge parameter through the parameter beta one, so it's of a logic um, form. And Chatterjee and Diaconis showed that under some conditions, exponential random graphs are asymptotically close to Bernoulli random graphs. And the natural question is, of course, how close? So if we've got our Laurentian family network on 16 vertices, is that uh, close to a Bernoulli random graph? Is it so close that we can use Bernoulli random graphs for drawing inference? So um, we set up Stein's method for this problem. And uh, the Markov process is as follows. We uh, pick, so we, we, we start in a, in a current set X, and then we pick an edge indicator, IJ, um, at, at the time when an exponential clock rings, and then we sample the edge between them. So the probability of adding the edge, we can calculate this from the exponential random graph model. So this is just, um, uh, the, the probability that, um, so, so adding an edge I denote by the superscript ij1. So this means um, we have an edge at, um, uh, for the edge, for the, for the vertex pair ij, and ij0 denotes we do not have an edge between i and j. And so we've just got this uh, odds form, you can actually write as a um, compact form in terms of a tangent. You can write down the generator of this Markov process. This is just um, so the uh, the sum of all possible edges i j, um, the difference between uh, f of x um, at having an edge or not having an edge minus a term which doesn't depend on f of x. And here is this uh, rotation n choose two. So it's not interest to it. So this is just the set of all potential edges. Then we define two key functions which depend on HL. So these are um, polynomials. A phi of A is the sum of a beta L, E L, E is um, yeah, this unit vector A to the E L minus one. And phi of A is then uh, E to the, then phi of A is E to the capital um, phi of a times two divided by e to the two capital phi of a plus one. And then we can set the absolute value of phi of a by taking the absolute value of the beta L's. And the, uh, so we need these two functions in order to di um, define a star. So a star satisfies a star is phi of a star. So these, these five functions, they come from large deviation considerations um, from Chatterjee and Diaconis. Um, so A star will be the edge probability for the approximating Bernoulli edge Renyi random graph, but all edges are um, IID. All edge indicators are IID. And we also need a technical condition that the betas are such that a half Phi prime uh, valued at one is less than one. And then if you've got an exponential random graph model with parameters beta, the, for all functions h, which are real values, the expectation h of x um, minus expectation h of six can be bounded by the maximum absolute change made by switching a coordinate of h, which is delta h, times n choose two times a constant, which depends on this polynomial phi, which is explicit. And then here was sum from n equal two up to k beta L times the variance of this change in uh, just one co coordinate uh, TL of z. TL are these uh, summary con um, statistics. So if H is Bernoulli, then 
we only have H1, so all the betas would be zero from L equal to up to K. So um, with this, uh, so we will get exactly zero with this bound. So, so that's good. And uh, just, just a um, couple more remarks. So one can show that the variance of the, the of this term here is of order at most one over n. So the so this variance would be of order one over um, root n. And the maximum change for h, if h is um, a proportion of a small subgraph, this would be order n to the minus two. And so the overall bound would then be of order one over root n. So if you choose the wrong test functions, of course, we won't get a small bound. But if you use a test function, which is sensible, then we get a bound, which is small. Now, looking at such subgraphs, it too relates to a graph on convergence, so a, a notion of convergence of networks. And, and also to note that if the coefficients beta 2 up to beta k go to 0, then the bound goes to 0, So as it should be. So it's a sensible bound uh, in this way. So now we've got a, a style operator for exponential random graph models. So how can we use this to assess goodness of fit? So for that, we have to step back a little bit about ideas uh, to use Stein's method to assess goodness of fit. So um, if you just go back to what we said about Stein's method to assess distances between distributions, we have our Stein operator A, which gives rise to the Stein equation H of X minus capital H of X, uh, expectation H of X is capital A F of X. So this is the Stein equation. We replace X by any random element W we're interested in to get expectation H of W minus expectation H of X is expectation AF of W. And so this is one way of comparing the distribution W and X by taking suprema over test functions h from a set of test functions capital H. So in particular, the Wasserstein distance um, between distributions, well here right, the distributions of x and y, just write x and y, which is um, bad practice, but um, you know what I mean. So it's a supremum over all h, which are Lipschitz, Lipschitz with constant one, expectation h of x minus expectation h of y. Or you can write it as the supreme over all f, which solves the A Stein equation, this one here, uh, for H in Lipschitz one of expectation AF of W. Okay. So why do we take Lipschitz one? Um, so we, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, so we don't necessarily have to take Lipschitz one, but maybe first to say the int intuition. So if X is uh, close to W in distribution, and if AP is a Stein operator for X, then expectation APG of W should be approximately zero for all sufficiently regular functions G. And so instead of taking Lipschitz functions, you can just take some class of functions G to assess the difference between the distribution of x and of w and by taking supremo of g and g absolute value of expectation of apg of w so uh, gorham and mucky um, introduced the stein discrepancy um, which is just um, so it depends on the probability to measure q um, of, of W, the P, the PDF we are interested in, the Stein operator A for the for P and the class of functions G on which uh, the operator A, P is defined and some norm, then for any of these, of these choices, we have a Stein discrepancy. So we call this the, uh, well, it depends on the norm and the class of functions on the operator Stein discrepancy from Q to P. So we take the supremum over OG in this class of functions of the norm of the expectation of the operator APG evaluated at W, the object of interest. 
which space G should we choose? So for practical purposes, choosing all um, solutions of Stein equations for Lipschitz functions is not an easy class to evaluate, to finding that supremum. So, so instead, people have um, are, are proposing a, what's called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So what is that? So there's a theorem by Moore and Aronshine. If K is a symmetric and positive definite kernel on a set S, then there is a unique Hilbert space of functions on the set S for which K is a reproducing kernel. So this space is called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So what does this mean? So if we've got a reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, with an inner product, um, which is uh, which I've denoted by this inner product notation, then the reproducing property is that a function f from this space uh, to the real numbers can be represented as inner product of the kernel kx and f. So here the uh, um, f of x is k of x, and then here the inner product is taken over the variable. So f has also got a variable here. And this operator Lx is a bounded operator on H. So we can sort of collapse and expand these, these, um, the kernel representation. Yeah. So this gives rise to the kernelized uh, Stein discrepancy. So this, this is an idea which goes back to Tchaikovsky et al and also Liu and uh, Michael Jordan um, and uh, with um, Guillaume Jules and uh, Yves Swan, we extend extended this. Um, so if X has uh, distribution P and Y has distribution Q, and then the kernel Stein discrepancy between P and Q based on the Stein operator AP for P is um, the expectation APF of Y by taking the supremum of all functions F uh, from a unit ball of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this has the appealing quantity if p is equal to q, then this expectation will be zero. But also with this reproducing kernel representation, so f of x is, can be written with this kernel product f, the, the inner product, then I, the kernel Stein discrepancy is the supremum over, over all f um, placing F here by this inner product gives an inner product um, expectation of APK of X and capital Y and F. Um, actually, it should be, should be Y. So this is um, taking the supreme all over in this unit. This is just the Hilbert space norm of this operator. And so you see here the, in this Hilbert space norm, the kernel appears, but there is no function F anymore. So that's, that's uh, very appealing. And uh, moreover, we can evaluate the Hilbert space now. So if we've got a um, PDF with a Stein operator from Gorm and Mackey, um, um, so this would be a continuous PDF. Um, so the operator is the inner product F of W uh, gradient log P of W plus uh, gradient f of w, we can set hp of xy as the inner product between the upper sine of the ap value of the kernel at x and ap the kernel um, at y and taking wherever the dot is for the inner product, which we can write out explicitly here. Then if I take the squared sine discrepancy this is just exactly the expectation of HP of Y and Y prime, where Y and Y prime are independent and have distribution Q. So, so this is a, a neat representation. And we can estimate it now from samples, say YI and YJ prime, say two sets of samples um, by using this function H part P. And we have a, a method of moment estimator of the um, KSD squared by taking the one over n squared, some i to one of n, j to one of n, hp 
of Y and YJ prime. And sometimes people also use this U uh, statistic type estimator. We only have one set of samples um, which are independent and we have uh, HP of YI and YJ and the normalization is slightly different. And we can look at um, how, how these, uh, um, but at the asymptotic behavior. So we, with um, Guillaume Mijoul and Yves Swan, we looked at a, a small toy example, a centered student T distribution with L degrees of freedom. We've got an operator, a stand operator, which is slightly different from the one that I've showed before, because I said we can generalize this to other Stein operators, so F prime of Y minus L plus one Y divided by L plus Y squared times F of Y. And then we um, generate samples IID from the centered um, student T distribution with L degrees of freedom. We use this kernel, an exponential kernel, E to the minus X minus Y squared over two to get the um, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And then we just estimate our Stein, uh, kernel Stein discrepancy by the average one over n1 and two, the sum over the i's and j's, a p y a p y prime k of y i y j prime. But this just means we have the first operator a p applied to the first component y i and the second one to the second component of the kernel. So here are simulations. Um, we estimate the quantiles. Um, under the null high uh, distribution by simulations and run a, a Monte Carlo test. So L is equal to five is our true null hypothesis. And if we, we can run simulations with different Ls, and here, so we see at the 5% level, you compare actually to the KS test. So at the 5% level, um, we, uh, uh, we have about 5% uh, of, of the observation um, rejecting the null hypothesis using the this uh, KSD estimator, which is sort of comparable to the KS test. And um, so, it's, so the the, um, the performance is slightly, yeah, so it's comparable to the KS test probably not the best test uh, possible, but the advantage is that it generalizes to higher dimension. So this is how it can work in principle. Now, what about our uh, exponential random graph models now? So in the exponential random graph models, we have um, uh, the intractable likelihood. So we use our Stein operator, or Stein characterizations, but a uh, main issue is that we don't usually have IID observations available. We only have one network. But we can simulate uh, from an exponential random graph model if we know its parameters. So the standard approach for assessing goodness of fit to an exponential random graph model mm -hmm. comes from Hunter et al. These are Monte Carlo tests. They are based on dyadic statistics, so di different types of, of uh, counts such as edgewise shared partners. Um, so it works like that. We estimate the parameters of the model, then we generate networks from the model and we compare the observed dyadic statistics. There are, there are other uh, approaches using spectral summaries, but so it's, it's general this Monte Carlo type approach. So how about um, using our Stein operator instead and doing a kernelized um, statistic? So this is joint work with Wenkai Xu um, and which is in progress. So, so we have a, um, so for, for, for the kernelized Stein method, we have a Stein operator, um, this one here. Uh, we cannot obtain IID copies for a given network unless we know the underlying distribution. But our intuition is that if the network comes from an exponential random graph model, then it has an exchangeable structure. So, so um, when you look at different parts of the network and distributions, they should look similar. So local features should be similar in distribution. So in particular, if we look at edge 
indicators of which we have to, of the of interest to um, we have exchangeability. And so, what do we use as uh, a graph kernel Stein statistic? So, our Stein operator. Um, remember works such that we, we pick an edge indicator at random and we sample it. So if I say S is in, in uh, a vertex pair, I can set just A beta S F of X as the change by resampling um, edge S uh, if, under the, the beta model. So it's Q of X S with um, replaced by one condition on the rest of the network times the change in f of x plus this deterministic term f of x at zero minus f of x. And now I pick an edge indicator uniformly at random. So then I can write our, write our um, Stein operator ABA f of x as the expectation of a uniformly, um, of an edge picked uniformly at random of a beta s f of x. So this is just this, the same expression. So based on this resampling, we introduce this graph kernel Stein statistic, so GKSS we call it. It's the supreme overall F in a unit ball of a RKHS of the expectation on a resampling of A beta S F of X. So little x is the network which is fixed. The randomness lies in the resampling of the edges. So um, the, this uh, GKSS, let's go back to this, because it's the supremum, although um, the, uh, so for any fixed function f, this expectation is zero. When we take the supremum, of course, it's no longer zero because we could choose our functions f uh, depending on the, the network x. So it doesn't, so even if, if X has um, the exponential random graph model distribution, this doesn't have mean zero, the, our statistic. But using the results with Nathan, we can approximate it by the corresponding quantity for a Bernoulli random graph with the edge probability A star. And in the Bernoulli random graph, the edge indicators are independent and we can derive an approximate uh, a normal approximation using Stein's method. And we can also calculate its mean and its variance, which depend on the kernel K with, which we've chosen. So, so we have some handle on the distribution of this graph kernel Stein statistic. So we don't call it a discrepancy anymore because it doesn't have uh, mean zero, but we, we know what its expected uh, behavior is at least if we are close to a Bernoulli random graph. And to, to estimate the uh, um, GKSS, we, um, well, we would again probably take the square, but the, we can resample the Stein operator by just um, drawing edge indicators with replacement and looking at um, the uh, a, B, S, B, F of X, where S, B is the, the edge indicator which was sampled in the beat sample. So here we fix X, the network, and we resample the edges. And so, so all the randomness is in the resampling. And of course, this is then an unbiased estimator of the Stein operator A, B, F of X. And so we, we use a, a kernelized uh, um, version uh, again with the inner product squared because that's slightly easier to, uh, to evaluate the, uh, the supremum function. So we take the inner product and use um, the inner product between a beta of sp and a beta sp prime, where sp and sp prime are two sampled edge indicators. And we sum over all the sampled edge indicators and um, take one over b squared. And now we use this as a test statistic in the Monte Carlo test. So we, we simulate networks from the null distribution and we assess how much the observed statistic differs from the simulated statistic. 
And so we have a synthetic experiment. We have um, a null model, which is an exponential random graph with only edges and triangles, um, with the chosen such that our assumptions are satisfied. And the alternative model would include a, a two stars as well. And for the simulation, we use what's called a widespread element kernel, which is based on counting subtrees between two graphs. I'm just going to flash aside to you. So these are uh, methods which we are comparing against. Um, these are edge counts, um, degree-based tests, uh, graphical tests from, from Hunter. So for the graphical tests, in order to compare them, we looked, we converted them into total variation distances. And then there's also a test statistic, which is Mahalanobis distances between, um, here we use degrees, you could use other um, um, summary statistics. And this is, this is our result. So we have uh, the, the red line is our uh, graph KSS um, with 50 replicas and um, the purple one, no, the purple one is with 50, the red one is 100. So increasing um, the number of um, resampling improves the convert the, the performance. So you see, see at, at zero, this is the truth. This is where we achieve um, the minimum of our statistic, which is not the true, true for for uh, competitors. And then um, the power goes up relatively well. The degree, um, um, so the the uh, total variation distance between the degrees. Um, does better for small beta, for negative beta, beta, but doesn't capture the, uh, um, the uh, so it's not small as, as the true value p. So this is pretty much all I wanted to say. So future directions. Um, so this, in this paper with Guillaume Jules and Yves Swan, we've got a general framework for multivariate sign characterizations. Um, which could be extended to multivariate discrete distributions um, along the lines of a paper with Christoph Ley, which we've done. And we have, haven't done this yet. Um, so there are, there's a lot more flexibility, uh, something that you can do. Uh, more asymptotics. So I think we get a handle on the behavior under alternative distributions for our statistic. And of course, we want to look at more examples. I should say we have looked at a, uh, a few real life examples but I thought the talk was already long enough. And I think I've um, filled my time already and a little bit over that. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Hedina. <clears throat> um, now we have some time for questions. Just if you have some questions or comments, just ask. Andrew, do you have a question? Because your mic is muted and you are speaking. Yes, I should say that uh, the, uh, this test was inspired by conversations with my advisor, Andrew Barber. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I've totally forgotten. Uh, I just wanted to ask in this um, final example, uh, you take uh, a subsample of edges, uh, the number is B. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you not just take all edges? I mean, how n choose two? Is that computationally too tough? Or ah, um, actually, I, sh I, sh uh, I should have added. We have, we have n is equal to twenty, so we oversample. Mm -hmm. So we could have taken n choose two, but so we have uh, so we've run simulations. So we need roughly twice the number of edges. To resample in order to get a reasonable performance. So B is so it's an oversampling method. So we sample with replace with replacement, mm -hmm. and so we we um, I'm, I'm just going. By, I probably can't show this to you because it's it's harder to check. But yeah, so we found roughly that if if B is um, twice n. We get uh, we start to get uh, a good power for the test. Twice n as opposed to n choose two. Oh, oh, twice capital n, so twice n choose two. 
no, no, quite, no, yeah, twice, twice n, yes, as opposed to n choose two, yes. Right, because, because I mean, n choose two would be computationally more extensive, but it would actually give you the, the generator rather than an estimate. Exactly. Yes. When we do things like uh, super oh, high, the like larger, larger size, which is about like 2000 number of vertices, then this subsampling give a lot of, uh, give the computational efficiency a bit better. Right, so, so that's the reason for doing it. Because also we find we don't really need to compute the actual thing, which is the n choose to like summing over all edges to get a good power. We actually find that it's about the size of n to get a good power. I see. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing we we can sort of explore further to say why is this order n thing, or is there theoretical guarantees for this? all the end stuff. I mean, right. now it's just sure. empirical. Sure. Yeah, so, so actually, so as I'm talking, it's sort of uh, a nice problem. We've got, because we've got B going to infinity through the number of samples yeah. which we draw, but also uh, asymptotic in terms of graph size and going to infinity. Yeah. And of course, the asymptotics will be different depending on how these two relate. Right. So currently, we just think of B over N being a, a fixed fraction. Mm -hmm. No, as a product, but we could explore other as a product. Sure, sure. And it's um, it's sort of nice for so for the uh, Bernoulli random graph models, um, we have this almost short type result that if you have a fixed network, it will look like a it will be close to to a, a normal, so we nor normally distribute it around the uh, um, the true expectation, roughly. So we've got um, the we've got the approximations of the exponential random graph to the uh, um, Bernoulli random graph in probability, and then we've got the Bernoulli random graph approximation for the the observed GKSS, so that that mm -hmm. will what we actually want to estimate so we've got a sort of different layers of approximation right so yeah. does it does it only it only works if um the ergum is close to an erdos any random graph is that right well it works so far in the regime that we've shown that we can apply our generator and that that the two are, are small which is um it doesn't have to be in uh so, so we've also applied it to examples but so so we don't so we don't fit to the Bernoulli random graph, we fit to the exponential random graph, but yes, the exponential random graph has to be in this regime where we are close to a Bernoulli random graph. In, so where, where we are so close enough in a Bernoulli random graph. So if n went to infinity, we would actually converge to a Bernoulli mm. random graph. Is that just so the, like some MCMC actually converges or, I mean, because it seems like you could just apply the algorithm without worrying about whether it's close to an Ernie. Like a like a like a statistician would, you know. <laughs> yes, um, you you could. That would be cruel. But there's uh, yeah. So the so problem is indeed that the MCMC, um, the so unless we are in this regime, the MCMC is not guaranteed con to converge. Mm. So yeah, um, there are results about so a two star model where we know the different regimes of convergence. So sometimes you have a, a single fixed point, someone, sometimes you have two fixed points and it should be possible to do something about it, but we haven't done that yet. Yeah, this kind of mixture thing, that's right, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question. I mean, uh, going back to slide 26 or uh, that, the, the soccer, can you, what happens to other subgraph statistics? Like, uh, I mean, we've been looking at centered subgraphs recently, which is sort of, uh, instead of, uh, instead of, I mean, the, the regular subgraph can be represented as you take, um, how should I say, um, you, you take products of the indicate, the edge indicators, and that if that's one, then there is a subgraph. And if it's not, the one of the edges is not present, right? And so you can center that. So that means instead of looking at the indicators, you can look at centered indicators. And they should these statistics show up when you do like 
do like sort of hurting the compositions. Can you get results for that as well? Or is how restrictive are you in terms of? Well, I mean, this, this here is a general result on page 25. This is any function. So. But I suppose for, yeah. for some functions, it, you'll get something informative and for some other functions you won't. Do you have sort of a gut well, so, feeling for what sort of functions it works? Well, you have to do the right scaling. You, so you, um, I think you should be able to do your uh, your scaled counts, uh, so so of your centered counts, as long as you stay you, you scale by the uh, n to the power of vertices, as long as you look at the proportion of centered counts. Okay, I guess it's it's a matter of plugging in and then looking what mm. you get. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Adrian, are you saying you want to change the TLs to be like? some kind of centered version yes yes uh, TLs, okay not the h yeah okay. to be some well kind of well I, 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 either way i mean it's, it's yeah i think for the h is both will be interesting i mean it, if you i mean if you change to a centered version can you still rewrite it as like a linear combination of the tls maybe mm. i'm not sure of maybe other tls you know because you'll still have products of these Bernoullis and summing them up, but they'll have coefficients with the sort of expectations of the Bernoullis or, you know, the, whatever, whatever centering you're using. Yes, to be reflected in the coefficients, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's so the, 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 the graphs H, they can, of course, be overlapping in any way. Well, they are overlapping if you have two stars and triangles. Um, Okay, thank you. But the key thing is always in the scaling. So, so for the for the t statistic, um, where are they here? So that the counts are scaled appropriately. So we take um, so it, it, it is like um, one over uh, n to the power of vertices, but then multiplied with n squared. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, if not, let us thank our speaker again. Yeah, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for your yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I just would like to remind that uh, next two weeks uh, we have seminars and we return to our usual time, 5 p.m. And it was small confusion today, Melbourne time. Let us call this Melbourne time. <laughs> yeah, okay. What are we well, thank you very much for, for allowing me to talk an hour later. 7 a.m. would have been really tricky with some <laughs> like. <laughs> Many thanks for agreeing to give a talk at such an early time. I really appreciate it. Well, I was, I was unaware, well, I should have looked it up, but, so I, I should have known that the clock changed at a different time in Australia than in the UK. Because our clock will only change in two weeks' time, and I thought it's no problem. Uh, yes. But I mixed that up. Thank you. But, so thank you very much for uh, for making allowances. Thank you.